Welcome to the Sony ZV-1 Setup Guide. My name is Jason Vong, and I'll be your tour guide on this journey to understanding how your camera works. Now, before we begin, I just want to let you know that this video is part of a huge ongoing resource that I'm putting together for this camera. There are some videos already, and I'll be adding more soon, so please subscribe to the channel as well as the ZV-E1 playlist so you don't miss out on future updates. And this helpful guide is brought to you by our friends over at B&H and Squarespace. Since this is primarily a video camera, we'll be mainly covering the features relating to it, but we'll also briefly touch on the photo capabilities of the ZV-E1. First off, if you already changed a few settings on your camera but want to try out mine, you can save what you have right now and reload it later in case you decide you like your original settings instead. Head to the main menu, find the yellow briefcase tab, which is the last option, and select Reset and Save Settings. Select Save and Load Settings and hit Save. If it's grayed out, that means you just need to insert an SD card. Simply come back to this section if you want to load your previous settings. Now take the extra step and back up your settings file on your computer. If you want to help support the channel and the amount of time it took to put together this guide, I made my entire settings file downloadable. In the past, I've gotten a lot of requests for this. So for $5, you'll get my ZV-E1 settings profile exactly how I have it on my camera. Now, of course, you do not have to pay to download the file. Every single detail that you need to know is already in this video. This is just to help speed things along. And after you download, you can always watch through the guide to see which individual settings that you might want to tweak for your own use. Anyways, let's get started. It's time for a fresh start. Come back out to the settings reset and hit initialize. This will completely reset the camera back to the day you took it out of the box. So for language, we're going to go down to Italian because why not? Let's just make this harder for ourselves. Just kidding. Let's select English. I understand. Do not connect for now. Skip connection with smartphone for now. Set area, date, and time. I'll let you go ahead and do this. All right, auto power temperature. This is important. Make sure to set it to high. Think of this camera having two heat limits. By setting it to a higher level, you're sort of putting it on the edge. It will stay on longer despite running hot to record as long as possible. And this is helpful if you're trying to maximize your long form 4K recording. If it's asking you to do pixel mapping, go ahead and cover your lens with a lens cap to perform that operation. Now that the initial setup is done, let's go over the out-of-box functions. Since this is primarily a video camera, we'll be focusing on the video settings. We'll briefly cover the photography section later. Go ahead and make sure the ticker is set to video. So this camera right here is designed for two different types of users. One, the button pushers for those who are used to and are comfortable navigating through the menu with the physical buttons. Or two, the touch tappers for those who are used to the touch screens on their phones. But I think to really take advantage of this camera, we should utilize both methods of operation. As it stands right now, a lot of the buttons right here have redundant commands that the touch screen UI here already provides, thus freeing up these buttons to be reprogrammed to do something else. But before we do that, We'll go over their default functions first. That way you have a better understanding of what they do and can choose to customize it to your own personal liking later. We'll start off with going over the buttons first. So right next to the on and off, we have a rocker that controls the zoom. And we, of course, have the shutter button right here for photos and photo mode, which can be reprogrammed to trigger movie recording as well. But we also have a dedicated movie record button here as well. And right off to the edge is C1, background defocus. Now, this is a one push button that either defocuses the background or tries to bring everything in focus with clear. It's an easy way to get that background blur or portrait mode without needing a background in aperture. No pun intended. Now, if you're using these types of lenses with an aperture ring, just make sure to rotate it to A to take advantage of the background defocus feature. This mode taker here allows us to toggle between photo mode, video mode, and S and Q mode. S and Q stands for slow and quick, and it's a mode that allows us to shoot slow motion or time lapse quickly. We'll keep it on video for now. Corner over here, we have a dial to adjust various settings, and right next to it is the main menu button. We're not going to push that quite yet. C2, which is currently set up as step zoom, this quickly punches into your shot by one and a half times or two times. Keep in mind, if you are filming in 4K, the step zoom only goes up to one and a half times. Fn is the quick function button. Now, I won't get into too much detail for each function yet. We'll save that when we get into the main menu walkthrough, but just really quickly, picture profile, one of the two ways to change the look of your footage, it's currently grayed out right now because we're in intelligent auto mode. Audio record level, just keep it default 26 if you don't plan on using an external mic. Stabilization, keep it active for now. Recognition target, you can choose between the various subject recognition the camera should prioritize for. We'll keep it on human for now. Focus mode, keep it in autofocus continuous. Soft skin effect, which adds smoothening to your face. I personally like to have it off. White balance is currently grayed out right now because we're in intelligent auto. Mic directivity controls where the mic will focus on. We'll keep it on auto for now. Framing stabilizer. 
It's off for now. We'll explain how to use this later. Next up is touch function in shooting. By default, it is set up as touch tracking. This will put a tracking box on your subject, but if you select and push to the right, you have an option of using touch tracking with auto exposure. Basically, it's like adjusting exposure on a smartphone. You tap somewhere on the screen where you want the camera to properly expose for, and you can adjust the brightness of the scene by using that slider. Focus area, we'll keep it wide for now. Shoot mode, intelligent auto. This pretty much means your camera decides the best exposure setting for you, but you can still control how your visuals end up looking, which I'll show you in a sec when we do a quick walkthrough for the touchscreen UI. Moving on to the control wheel. Like a dial, it can control and adjust certain settings. Up is display. You can keep pressing it to cycle through the different UIs on screen. And down is exposure compensation, which is currently disabled right now because we are in intelligent auto mode. Left is a self timer, counts you down before the camera starts recording. Just like that. And right is ISO, also disabled right now because we're in intelligent auto mode, so ignore for now. Playback is where you will go review your photos and videos, and a trash can here deletes files when you're in playback mode. But in filming mode, it is product showcase, which essentially turns off face and eye autofocus so you can do object show and tell. All right, moving on to the touch screen at UI. You can swipe on either side of the screen to bring up the touch UI. You can also swipe up to bring up the familiar quick function menu. Now, you're gonna find a lot of redundant functions here on the touch UI, a lot of which we already went over. That's why I said we can reprogram a lot of the physical buttons here to maximize the customization of this camera. However, you cannot reprogram any of the touch UI buttons here. We'll start off on the left side first. It might look different to you depending if you have the screen flipped out or not, but on my left side, I'll call it side A, the first one is mode, next one is self timer, mic directivity, Cinevlog mode. Now this will mimic a cinematic aspect ratio and give you an option of different cinematic color profiles to make your footage seem more cinematic. <laughs> And on the very bottom right here is my image style. Now this one's exciting because it makes photography and videography more accessible for beginners. If you're used to creating photos and videos on your smartphone, then you'll feel right at home. You can adjust focus, exposure, color, and focus speed simply by dragging the sliders back and forth. You don't have to understand camera terminologies to achieve the look you want. That is why a lot of those options were disabled earlier because this is where you would go to to adjust the look of your image when you're using intelligent auto mode. Now the downside is, is that this will all get reset when you power off the camera, much like a phone camera where all your settings get reset when you exit the app. I do wish it allowed you to save a couple of customized settings though. Now, if you're not in intelligent auto mode, this changes to creative style, which is essentially color filter profiles. Over here on side B, we have the record button, product showcase, subject recognition, autofocus selection, step zoom, and playback. On the bottom right here, they call it footer. If you're in some type of manual mode, here's where you'll be able to adjust shutter speed, aperture, ISO, exposure compensation, and white balance using touch. So you can pretty much start filming now if you want to. A couple of things that you might want to change is the file format and frame rate if you want to shoot something else other than the default 1080p60. But if you are shooting 1080p60 for S and Q settings, just make sure that the frame rate on the right here is set to 120 frames per second so you can shoot footage at half speed slow motion. Now, just in case you're wondering why you don't see 60 or 120 frames per second and only see 50 and 100p, that means you're in POW mode. To change that, head to the last tab, go to area and date, and change this to NTSC mode, and you should see 60 and 120 frames per second. Now it's time for us to do a full menu deep dive so you can understand what each settings do. We'll come on down to the red tab with the film camera icon, and we'll start off with image quality. Video file format. So here's what I recommend for file format. XAVC HS 4K 10-bit 420 if you don't plan on doing too much color grading and still want the best quality possible. But if your computer cannot handle editing XAVC HS, then go back to XAVC S 4K 8-bit 420. That's the same codec as the A7 III and the A6000 and CV series. XAVC SI is the all intra highest video quality that you can shoot in, but it also creates huge video files, which makes sense because it's recording a lot of data per frame. There's very minimal compression, and this would be for pros who do a lot of commercial work, they work on film, or really need to color grade. It's best used with 10 bit 422 and S log 3, and you will need a really high end memory card for this. But if you're just shooting videos for the internet, you don't need to be shooting in SI. Moving on to movie settings, record frame rate. I typically do 24p for talking stuff and use 60p for slow motion stuff. 4K 120p and 1080p 240 frames per second are coming via a firmware update this summer, so definitely keep checking back when that firmware drops. 
Record setting. You have the option to select how much info you want recorded for bitrate, color info, and depth for videos. I know, that sounds complicated, but basically if you've ever heard of 10-bit 422 and how much of a big deal that is, this is why. It allows for more accurate and smoother color gradation over 8-bit because it has more information. You can really push the colors with 10-bit harder, whereas if you push 8-bit footage too hard, you will start to see blocky pixels in your footage. So only select 10-bit if you really plan on changing your colors. Next up, S and Q settings. S and Q stands for slow and quick. In this mode, it will capture the video and play back fast motion or slow motion in real time. However, it will not capture audio, so keep that in mind. To activate this mode, simply slide the ticker all the way to the right. And when you're done, just make sure to slide it back to the middle. Now for slow motion, record frame rate, select the usual frame rate you will use. For me, it's gonna be 24p. Frame rate, I'm gonna choose 60, that way it slows my footage down by two and a half times. For record setting, I'm gonna do 10-bit 420, but if you don't see that, go ahead and choose 8-bit 420. Moving on to time-lapse settings. Now this time-lapse method is great because it outputs a 4K video once you're done. Compare this to the interval shoot function in the photo option, that one shoots a series of raw quality photos, which will then require you to stitch together later. The latter option is great if you want really high quality time lapses, but it's a bit more work to do. So for quick video version, this is the way to go. For record frame rate, again, I'm going 24p. For the interval, there's an option between 1 to 5. If there's minimal motion in the scene, you can go up to 5, but if there's a lot of perceivable motion, you want to select 1. For record settings, again, 10-bit 420, but if you don't see it, choose 8-bit 420. For video light setting, we'll have it off. We don't need the tally light of the camera to be on while the time lapse is running. Next up, lock shooting setting. If this is grayed out for you right now, it means you're in intelligent auto mode. To get out of it, just go to the quick function menu and select one of these manual modes. Now, if you don't plan on color grading, you can skip this section. There's an easier way for you to still get that cinematic look via the Cine Vlog mode that I'll get into more details later. If you do know what log is and are interested in heavy color grading, this is where you would go to activate S-Log3. Now this mode here shoots in a very flat color profile that retains a lot of data, so you can really push the colors to achieve the cinematic look that you want. If you want to learn color grading, my friend and editor Dylan has a fantastic tutorial using DaVinci Resolve. I'll link in the description box below. For color gamut, the community is shooting S-Gamut3 Cine with S-Log3. Embed LUT file. If on, it means whatever light that you've placed inside of the camera, the color and look will get recorded with the footage. Now, some would say to keep this off and just use the LUT to monitor the exposure and the white balance of your footage and apply the LUT in editing. This just ensures the safety in case the LUT that you're using doesn't end up working out. Proxy settings. You will likely not need this if you're shooting 1080p, but if you're shooting 4K and you know your computer struggles to edit them, this option here shoots a secondary file that's much smaller alongside your 4K video file. So when you're editing, you would edit the proxies, making your life a lot easier. And when you export, just make sure to link your footage to the original 4K files. With that said, it does take up space on your card. So if you really need those proxies, I would actually recommend just creating them on your computer later. APS-C Super 35 shooting, it's currently grayed out for me right now because we're in 4K, so this is really mainly for 1080p shooters. This crops into your footage one and a half times so it resembles an APS-C camera. Now this is great if you have APS-C lenses, this will crop the vignetting out, or if you're using full frame lenses, this will give you an extra reach. For example, if you're using a 24 to 70 millimeter lens and you enable Super 35 mode, you're essentially converting your lens into a 35 to 105 millimeter lens. This gives video shooters a huge advantage because we now have a further reach with no quality loss. Insanely helpful. Now you'll notice the mode will be grayed out if you are shooting in 4K, and that's because this camera technically does not have enough megapixels to support shooting true 4K in APS-C mode. However, if you still want to use APS-C lenses in 4K, there is a well-known hack in the community that uses clear image zoom to zoom out of the vignetting. The tech behind clear image zoom is that it uses algorithms to enhance the image pixels so it doesn't look as mushy as a digital zoom, which digital zoom just enlarges your pixels. And unlike the FX3 and the A7S3, the E1 actually still retains all the autofocus features when activating clear image zoom. So that's pretty neat. The downside to this is that you will need to clear image zoom every time you power on your camera if you choose to use APS-C lenses with this camera and want to shoot 4K with them. Now for photo shooters, I would not recommend using APS-C mode on this camera for photography as you'll be lessening the megapixel count from 12 megapixels down to 5 megapixels. Moving on to lens compensation, I will keep these three on auto, 
breathing compensation. If you don't know what focus breathing is, you can just leave this off. It's mainly for very serious video shooters, and it's especially important for those who do a lot of cinematic work. This crops into your frame a bit, but it minimizes the noticeability of breathing. This is only compatible with most Sony first-party lenses. It may not and will likely not work with third-party lenses such as Tamron or Sigma. Coming down to media, format, this is where you would go to format your SD card, file, serial number, we can skip that, file settings though, I like to have my file name format with the date and title. And for the title name, I like to have something specific because I shoot with multiple Sony cameras, so it just makes it easier to differentiate where each footage comes from when I edit them on my computer. Moving on to shooting mode, and for shoot mode, I do manual exposure, but if you don't want to think about video settings, go ahead and change it to intelligent auto. Shutter and silent, silent mode settings. Turning this on will turn off the shutter sound in photo mode and the record confirmation in video mode. Helpful if you're in an area where you need to be discreet and quiet. Release without lens, just leave this enable. Anti-flicker set. This helps prevent the appearance of flickering in your photos or videos that are taken under certain types of lighting, such as fluorescent or LED lights. Now this happens because these types of lights flicker at a high frequency, which appears correct to normal human eyes, but random dark lines to the camera. When that happens, you can use this to adjust the shutter speed down to the decibels to match the frequency of the lights to eliminate flickering. Moving on to audio record settings. Audio recording, always on. For audio record level, by default it's 26. This is okay to use if you don't plan on using any external mic. It will just capture sound from the built-in mic. But I would typically set this around 12 if I'm using a shotgun mic or a lav mic. But I will say every mic requires different input settings, so I would test out the mic that you have to see which level is right for you. If it's hitting the red too often, it means it's too loud. You wanna stay between negative 12 and negative three decibel. Audio out timing, keep it live. Wind noise reduction, I personally like to keep this off because if it's on, it will make the audio sound like you're underwater. Mic directivity, which controls the direction of the mic. Here's a demo on how each works. All right, so this is the front microphone directivity. We're gonna have Vivian respond behind the camera now. Hi everyone, this is Vivian. It is a nice, beautiful spring day right now. My name is Jason Bong. We currently have the uh, rear mic directivity enabled right now, and I'm talking in front of the camera. Vivian, why don't you go ahead and say something? Hi everyone, it's Vivian. It is a beautiful spring day. My name is Jason Bong. We're testing out the odd direction of mic directivity. We got Vivian in the back. Why don't you go ahead and say something, Vivian? Hi everyone. Today is a nice, beautiful spring day. Now, one of the new features of this camera is that when you detect a face in front of the camera, the mic directivity switches to the front. But if I walk away. Oh, hi, it's Vivian. Jason walked away, so I'm gonna be talking from the rear. And now I'm back. The face autofocus should be kicking in and I'm talking right now, so I should switch to the front directivity. All right, welcome back. Mic direct select setting. I would say just leave them all checked for now. MI shoe audio set, we can skip this. This requires a very specific type of accessory. Coming down to number seven, TCUB. Now this entire section here pertains to timecode, which I don't personally use, so I'll go ahead and skip. This is more for pros who run multiple video and audio devices at the same time, and it just helps with syncing. Number eight, image stabilization. So for stabilization, we actually have four options. We have off, standard, active, and dynamic active. Now, standard stabilization offers some shake compensation to your footage, which is nice for handheld videos. Active stabilization is the next level. It does crop into your footage by 10% in exchange for more stable footage. Now, keep in mind though, this feature here works best with Sony lenses. Third-party lenses like Sigma and Tamron won't be able to take full advantage of active stabilization. Moving on to dynamic active stabilization. Now this is new to the ZV-E1 and it combines both active and electronic image stabilization. It does crop in a hell of a lot more, but you can literally walk with this camera and get some passable results. Doesn't quite replace a gimbal stabilizer, but uh, helpful in a pinch. Steady shot adjustment will keep it on auto. However, if you're using manual lenses, as in lenses that does not have any sort of autofocusing capability, you wanna come here and set this to manual and choose the focal length that you're using. The camera would do its best to compensate for the shake with whatever manual lens that you're using. Moving on to framing stabilizer. This takes advantage of the new dynamic active stabilization, so it does crop in a lot more in exchange for smoother footage. This helps keep your subject at a certain position on the screen. By default, it'll keep them in the center, but you can also lock them into one side of the screen. And I find this to work the best if you also try to keep the subject on your ideal side of framing. 
Number nine, zoom, zoom range. By default, it's clear image zoom, so even if you're not using a power zoom lens, the rocker in the front right here will perform a clear image zoom with any lens that you're using. Now, just to explain to you what clear image zoom is, it is a type of zoom that crops into your frame. It may seem similar to digital zoom, but it's actually using image enhancing algorithm to keep the images looking clean and sharp, whereas digital zoom literally zooms into your pixel, therefore making them larger and more blockier in the frame. Now, just FYI, power zoom lenses are zoom lenses that can only be zoomed when attached to a camera. The zoom rocker here will not, of course, zoom regular zoom lenses that require physical twists. Moving on to zoom lever speed, all of this just adjusts how fast you want the zoom to happen if you're using the rocker, the button, or a remote. For me personally, I like to have it at the fastest. Shooting display, grid line display, and type. Now, these are going to be guiding lines that appear on the screen to help you frame your shot with the rule of thirds and diagonals. And for me, I like to use diagonal and square grid. Emphasize record display. I have this on. This puts a giant red outline on your LCD screen to let you know that you're recording. Just a nice visual aid to have in case you sometimes forget to hit the record button on the camera. I hate to admit this, but it has happened to me more often than you think. So it's just nice to be able to see that I'm actually rolling on the camera. Number 11, marker display. This is more expansive than grid lines specifically for video productions to ensure shots are properly framed for a particular output format or platform. For example, in aspect marker, you can choose a 9 by 16 aspect ratio, which will help you frame for vertical videos while shooting the video horizontally. Keep in mind, this is an on-screen guide display for framing purposes only. You still have to apply the crop in editing. And for your information, Sony Cinematic Shooters love the 2, 3, 5 by 1 aspect ratio. So select this if you want to properly frame and deliver in this format. By the way, in Cine Vlog Mode, which we'll talk about later, the camera will automatically put black bars over your footage so you don't actually need to enable marker display. Number 12, shooting option. Product Showcase Set, this is Product Showcase, which we already talked about in the beginning of the video. Basically, it turns off face and eye autofocus so you can do object show and tell. Keep in mind, you can only toggle it on and off outside of recording. Defocus Level Set controls the background blur. Cinematic Vlog Set, now if you're somebody who's not looking to get into Hollywood, but you still really want that cinematic look without needing to spend a lot of time and energy learning how to properly expose S-Log in order to grade well in post with confusing color curves, try out Cinematic Vlog Mode. Basically, you get the 235 by 1 wide cine aspect ratio with black bars already baked into the frame. It automatically locks into 24 frames per second, which is the movie standard frame rate. And if you want to shoot in slow motion, you can actually just switch over to S and Q and it will shoot in 60p and automatically slow it down to 24. Bear in mind, in S and Q mode, it does not record any audio. And in this mode, you have certain looks and moves that mimic certain color grades. S Cinetone for that cinematic color found their cinema camera. Clean for that refreshing look. Chic for that profound look. Fresh for that colorful look. And Mono for black and white. The mood here changes the tone of your image. You can just leave it on auto or use gold for a more warmer look. Ocean for a much cooler look. Or forest, which I like to call the nostalgic look. I like to call it the twilight look. Autofocus transition speed. Low, medium, high. You can control how fast the focus shifts between the subjects. Self timer. This gives you a countdown before the camera starts recording. Auto framing settings. Now this is really designed for solo creators in mind. When enabled, the camera will frame the subject in the center. So if you're off center, the camera will crop in and center you. And you can decide how much it crops by based on the large, medium, and small option. And you can set a 15 or 30 second interval in which it will mimic a constant zoom. It is a great way to add a bit of production value for beginners if they don't want to do the key framing and editing for that kind of zoom. And they're really marketing this to be good for interviews, podcasts, live internet shows, music performances, etc. And I would say for best result, I would just keep the tracking speed at medium, which is three, and the crop level to either medium or small. By the way, here's an idea for you. If you use an external recorder monitor, what you can do is record simultaneously one file to the cart with the auto framing and the other on crop clean wide shot on the external recorder. However, if you're a beginner, I doubt you would invest in a $500 Atomos monitor just to be able to do this. But hey, if you're a professional, just a food for thought. Moving on to the next tab, exposure and color. Number one, exposure, auto slow shutter. We'll leave it on. ISO, leave on ISO auto for now. ISO range limit, 40 to 400, 9,600. I know, a pretty high number, but this sensor is capable for extreme low light, so we'll leave it as is. 
Exposure comp, leave it at zero, zero. Exposure step, make sure this is 0.3 EV. Moving on to number three, metering. Metering mode, leave it on multi, face prio on multi metering on, and spot metering point on center. White balance, we'll leave it auto for now. That more pertains to different scenarios of the scenes that we'll be filming. Priority set in auto white balance, we'll keep it in standard and shockless white balance, leave it at fast. Moving on to color and tone, and this is all really personal preference, and here's mine. There are various creative looks you can experiment with, and I highly encourage you do so. But personally, I've been using standard with dynamic range optimizer on auto for the last five years for both photos and videos, and I personally think it looks the best for straight out of camera, true to life colors. No color grading is necessary. Within the last couple of years, Sony made tweaks to their color science, and it's been looking better and better with every camera release, so this is probably the best yet. And I've been seeing other video shooters starting to use the same setting as well when they need to deliver videos quickly without having the trouble of grading S log first. They might tweak their sharpness and contrast and shadows and whatnot, but that I would personally just leave this all alone. Coming back to Dynamic Range Optimizer, I know some video shooters do not like having this on, but I personally like the slight HDR effect that it gives, where my shadows are a bit more brought up and my highlights are a bit lower to help create a more balanced visuals. 90% of my YouTube videos are shot this way, and I think it looks great. Moving on to picture profile. Earlier we talked about S-Log3 and for veteran alpha users, you will notice PP7-9 to are missing. And that's because they moved it over to log shooting back in tab one. But PP10 still houses the HLG profile and PP11 has the S-Cinetone profile. So if you wanna film with S-Cinetone without the black bars from Cinevlog mode, come here instead. Select LUT. So this is grayed out right now. So let's go back to tab one here just to show you what it looks like. So in log shooting mode right here, this is where we now have to enable S-Log3. Coming back to color and tone, now we have the select LUT available to us. So this allows you to preview what your S-Log3 footage will look like. You can see it flat as it is with S-Log3, S709 for cinematic color reproduction, 709 800% for TV broadcast, or you can choose your own LUT. So coming back out to manage user LUTs, here's where you'll be able to import some of your favorite LUTs for S-Log. All you have to do is place the LUT files into your SD card, come back to the menu here and import them in. Again, you can just use these LUTs to monitor your exposure and white balance, which is the better play here, or you can have them bake into your footage by going back to tab one and turn on embed LUT. Now for the sake of this tutorial, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off S-Log 3 for now, can standard creative look. All right, picking up where we left off, soft skin effect. A nice option to have for those who want to smoothen out some of their blemishes for selfie vlogging. For me personally, you're gonna see it all. You're gonna see all those pimples. I'm gonna turn this off. Zebra display. Now this is incredibly helpful for video shooters to gauge overexposure in certain areas of the screen. If you plan on color grading, you need to take advantage of this feature to avoid losing details in the bright spots of your footage. And coming down to the focus tap, number one, autofocus, manual focus, focus mode. We'll keep it on continuous autofocus for now. Transition speed and sensitivity. Uh, for transition speed, we're going to lower this down to five. Sensitivity, we'll keep it at five. Transition is how fast a camera changes focus from one subject to another, and sensitivity is how quickly it switches focus target. I have a video going over the most common focus mistakes, so be sure to cue that up or subscribe to my ZVE1 resource playlist and watch it when you have time. Auto focus assist, we'll keep this off. Focus area, this is where you'll choose how much of the scene the camera will analyze and focus on. Wide chooses the entire scene. Zone chooses part of your scene with giant blocks of rectangle. Center chooses only the center. And spot chooses a specific point of your scene. Now I do have a guide that goes into greater details on how and when to utilize each of these different focus areas. It's a bit old, but it still contains a lot of relevant information. So click up here to queue it up for baby Jason Vong and save it for next time. For now, if you have touch tracking autofocus selected earlier, you can keep it on wide and use touch tracking when you need to be specific with your focus target. Focus area limit. Now this is nice because it takes away certain focus area options that you may never use. Focus area color. It's like your choice in wine, but for focus aid, I like white, but you can have it as red. We'll go ahead and skip these two and leave it as their default settings. Coming down to number three, subject recognition. Subject recognition and autofocus on recognition target. We have lots of recognition targets here. Some are kind of an overkill for most people, but hey, it's nice to have, but we can also disable them from appearing as options if we know for a fact we won't ever shoot them. That way you cycle through less options here on the touchscreen. 
For now, we'll keep recognition target on human. Right eye, left eye, select. We'll keep it auto. This prioritizes which eye the camera focuses on, and it's based on the subject's point of view. Subject recognition frame display. Um, have this on so you can see your focus boxes and know where the camera is focusing on. Face memory and register faces. This is helpful if you're filming yourself or you shoot a wedding or an event and need the camera to focus on a very specific person and ignore the rest. It's self-explanatory to set up if you want to give it a shot. Coming down to Focus Assistant, we'll keep most of these settings as is. Focus Map right here, it gives your camera a heat vision looking visual. Anything that's not covered in orange or blue is in focus. Anything blue is further away from focus and anything in orange is closer to focus. Now bear in mind, Focus Map only works with Sony lenses and not third party lenses. Coming down to peaking display. Now this is more for video shooters who do a lot of manual focusing. Basically when enabled, it'll show you a series of dots on the screen, which will indicate to you where the focus is. It's different from focus mapping, but both serve very similar purposes. Again, focus mapping only works with Sony lenses, but peaking works with any lenses. All right, moving on to the playback target. Now, most of these settings here only pertains to photos. So we'll actually skip this portion and come down to network. Connection and PC remote, smartphone connection. This is where you will come to if you want to connect your camera to your phone to transfer videos and photos. To not break the rhythm of this tutorial, I'll go over this later. Moving on to streaming. Here's where you get to select the frame rate of your webcam stream and whether or not you want the camera to simultaneously record. I would suggest 1080p60 as your output resolution and frame rate. I think that's pretty standard for streaming sites like Twitch and YouTube gaming, but feel free to change it to your preference. We'll go ahead and skip the rest of this all the way down to setup. Area and date, that's self-explanatory. Reset and save settings we went over already at the beginning of this video. For operation customized, these four options here are where we reprogram the physical buttons, but we'll come back and spend a lot of time on this after we finish going through the rest of this section here. Different set for stills and movies. Now this is key for hybrid shooters because you can have entirely different settings for photos and videos when you switch between them. I personally have all of these checked off. Screen display set, this is where you would go to toggle off the different UI displays from uh, coming up whenever you press the display button on your camera. I personally like to have all of these on. Record with shutter. I would have this on. This just makes a shutter button another record button when you're in movie mode. Coming down to dial customize, nothing to change here. Just keep them all as their default. Touch operation on if you plan on taking advantage of the touch UI and touch tracking autofocus. Shooting screen. If you don't want to use the touch UI at all, but still want to use touch tracking autofocus only, you can turn this off. Footer icon touch. You can enable and disable touch operation for aperture, shutter speed, ISO, and white balance. Swipe right, left, and up. You can change what the different swipe gestures do. Touch function in shooting, it's currently grayed out for me right now because I'm using an external monitor, but earlier we said to touch tracking, but you can set it up where it could be just touch to focus, touch to expose, or touch tracking with exposure control. Icons when monitor flip. You can decide if you want these buttons on the touch UI to flip depending if the screen is folded in or out. Come back out, these next two you can control if you want to use touch to navigate in playback and menu. Accessibility. This reads the menu out loud to you, which is pretty cool. Screen reader, speed, standard, volume, 15. Moving on to monitor, monitor brightness. So for monitor brightness, you have two options, manual and sunny weather. Sunny weather increases the visibility of your screen by raising the brightness, helpful if you're filming in high noon broad daylight outside. Display quality, we'll keep it at standard. And monitor flip direction, just leave it on auto. Display option. TCUB display setting, we'll skip. Gamma display assist. We'll keep it off. With the introduction of LUT display, you don't really need to use this unless you're going to be filming with the HLG profile, but for the most part, we'll skip. Coming down to power setting option, auto monitor does not turn off. Power save start time, I have it on five minutes, so the camera will go to sleep after five minutes of in operation. Power save by monitor. When you set it to both link, when you flip the LCD screen closed facing the camera, it puts it to sleep. Auto power off temperature high. This was the first thing that the camera prompted us to do, so it should be on high. Sound option, volume settings. This controls the volume of playback audio when you're reviewing footage on the camera. Four channel audio monitoring, we'll keep it one and two. Audio signals, this pretty much makes that sound when you start and stop recording. I personally like to have this on so I know when the recording is triggered, but if you need to be subtle, turn this off. 
USB settings, leave this all as is. Coming down to external output. For HDMI resolution, just keep it on auto. HDMI settings, leave it as is. HDMI info display, keep this off. The reason why I have this on is because I'm recording the settings menu, but you want to have this off. Otherwise, if you're using an external monitor, your entire screen UI will get recorded onto your footage. And trust me, you don't want that. Control for HDMI, I just leave it on. And finally, setup option. Video light mode, power link, record lamp. Personally, I like to have this off. When it's on, there's an indicator on your camera here that will light up. It's useful to confirm if you are indeed recording. And that's pretty much it. Whew. All right, now comes the fun part. This is where we're gonna customize some of the buttons to optimize the camera a bit better for our usage. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. Our friends over at B&H help sponsor this guide to empower creators like ourselves to create amazing photos and videos with our brand new ZV-E1. If you need a new lens, a dedicated mic, or even some minor accessories, head over to the B&H website first. If you're confused whether or not something fits into your workflow, they have an amazing support team on phone and on chat to help answer any of your questions. And the reason why I love shopping at B&H for the last 10 years is because they always got amazing deals on new and used items, and shipping is incredible fast. And hey, if you're ever in New York City, you gotta make a pit stop to their mega store. Believe me, it's a lot of fun to get lost in there for several hours. Once again, thank you B&H for making this ultimate guide for the ZVE1 free to the public. Now, it's time to customize. All right, now it's time to customize the buttons on the camera. Like I mentioned at the start of the video, to take full advantage of the camera, you will want to utilize both the touchscreen UI and the physical buttons. And since we cannot change the touchscreen UI, we will focus on the buttons to reduce the amount of redundant functions. The way we're setting up now is to optimize for hybrid shooting, serving the purpose to take photos and videos. These are what makes sense to me. I highly recommend following along to understand how I shoot and really customize the camera to your own liking. So jumping back into the menu, yellow briefcase tab, operation customize, we're actually gonna be starting with function menu settings first. You'll see here we have different functions for both photos and videos. And since we're mainly focusing on video, we'll start with the bottom first. For the most part, we'll only be changing a few items. Starting with the top row, picture profile, audio record level, stabilization, subject recognition, and focus mode, we'll leave them as their default. On the last option of the top row, since I don't use skin softening, I opted to change to autofocus transition speed as that's something I often change depending on the scene, whether I want the rack focus to happen faster or slower. On the bottom row, number one, white balance, we'll leave it as default. Moving on over, since we already have mic directivity on the touchscreen UI, we can replace this. I chose silent mode because we may be in places where absolute silence is needed, and this disables any shutter sound or recording chimes. Moving on, by default, this is framing stabilizer. As a personal preference, it's not something I will use. However, I do bounce between 24 and 60 frames per second a lot, so I made this into my record FPS. This allows me to switch to 60p on the fly for slow motion purposes, and I prefer this over S and Q because in regular movie mode, it still records audio, and more often than not, having that audio track has saved my butt in editing, even though the footage was intended to be slow motion only. In S and Q, because it opts to play back the slow motion in real time, it doesn't record any audio. So if you mess up and forget to switch back to regular movie mode, you'll just end up with a long slow motion clip that will likely not be usable if you intend it to capture audio. Moving on, touch function and focus area, we'll leave the master default. And the final option here on the bottom row, since we already have shoot mode on the touchscreen UI, we can replace this. Instead, I chose auto focus sensitivity and I situate this on the bottom. Usually when I change the transition speed here at the top, I'll likely need to change the sensitivity as well. All right, let's come up to the photo function menu. Now on your camera, you will notice the little video camera icon on the bottom of some of these functions. And that's because they're mirroring what we have in video. That's not recommended to leave as is because as you can see, when we change some of the ones in the video mode, it got reflected into the photo menu as well. And some of those functions are not necessary to the photo mode at all. So we'll go ahead and change those. And while we're at it for the ones that mirror the video functions and are still necessary to photo, we will still manually change them to what they're supposed to be. That way, when we do need to make changes to the video function menu in the future, our changes won't actually mess with the photo stuff. So again, going over the top row first, creative look, metering mode, stabilization, subject recognition, and focus mode, we'll leave them as their default. 
But on the last option of the top row, again, since I don't use skin softening, I changed this to right and left eye switch. Helpful in portrait situations where if the subject's hair is obstructing the eye the camera is trying to focus on, you can change it to the other eye where it's not obstructed. That way you get tack sharp focus on their eye. Coming down to the bottom row, white balance, subject recognition and autofocus, silent mode, touch function and focus area. We'll leave them as their default. But on the last option of the bottom row, again, a shoot mode is on the touchscreen UI. We're free to change it to whatever we want. For me, I chose tracking sensitivity. Coming back out, we're gonna be working on the video custom key and dial set first. For rear one, we have this as focus magnifier. By default, it was step zoom, but that's on the touchscreen UI already. And personally, I always have this as focus magnifier because I utilize autofocus and manual focus toggle often. And sometimes I do use manual only lenses and this helps me punch in and double check focus. Moving on to number two, by default, this was product showcase, but that's on the touchscreen UI. So I went ahead and changed it to AEL toggle. AEL stands for auto exposure lock. Oftentimes I utilize auto ISO whenever I'm running and gunning, rather than setting my ISO every time I point at something different with a slight change in lighting, I let the camera choose for me. Then I lock it down with this button here. So as I'm moving around during the same take, my exposure won't change, keeping things looking consistent. Now the difference between toggle and hold is that hold requires you to hold it to trigger the effect. Toggle turns it off until you press it again to turn it back on. Number three, by default, it was focus standard, but it's not needed in video in my opinion. So I went ahead and changed it to monitor brightness. Monitor brightness is something that I change on the fly. If I'm outdoor, I will switch to sunny weather so I can see my display better. Whenever I move indoors, I switch it back to manual to save battery. Number four, by default, it was self timer, but that's on the touchscreen UI. So I went ahead and changed it to grid lines because I use it often to help me frame my shots. Especially when I'm using a gimbal, this helps me see if my subject is in the center. Pressing the left button now will toggle it on and off. Number five, ISO and number six, exposure compensation. We'll leave the master default. Moving on to the top buttons. By default, this was background defocus, but I've changed it to autofocus and manual focus selector toggle. And this lives on all of my Sony cameras. This allows me to turn off autofocus quickly. Handy if you're filming a scene and don't want the camera to accidentally jump focus on something else. Now, of course, some lenses have built-in autofocus manual focus switches on them already, but you will come across a lot of third-party lenses that don't. So it'll be really handy to have this program as a button. Now, the difference between toggle and hold is that hold requires you to hold it to trigger the effect, and toggle turns it off until you press it again to turn it back on. Number two, movie shooting. We'll leave it as default. Coming down to the lens button, by default, it's focus hold. We'll leave it as is. Dial and wheel. Uh, we'll go ahead and leave it as is. So let's come back out and work on the photo custom buttons. By default, it's mirroring all the video functions, which again, it's not recommended to leave as is. It's always better to set them to what they need to be, even if they end up being redundant to the video functions. Because if one day we decide to change a button in video mode, it will affect photo mode as well, and that may not necessarily be the function we want in photo mode. With that said, I'll go over what's different. Number one is focus magnifier. Number two, switch right and left eye. So we did set this in our quick function menu earlier, but it's nice to have it as a handy button. The one in the quick function can act as a guide to remind us which eye we have it on. Number three, same thing, monitor brightness. Number four, by default, it was drive mode, but that's on a touchscreen UI. So instead, like video, I have it as grid display. Number five, ISO. Number six, exposure compensation. Moving over to the top buttons, same thing. Number one is autofocus, manual focus, selector toggle. And number two, we're gonna change this to movie setting. And the reason why we do that is because maybe we're accidentally in photo mode and we're caught with our pants down and we need to shoot video really quickly. We can just hit this record button and I'll start recording video. Moving down to the lens button, uh, I just kept it as focus hold. Dial and wheel, leave it as is. Coming back out, we're gonna work on playback custom buttons. And there's only one option I change here, and that is the top section. I changed the C1 to rating. So personally, I'm a spray and pray kind of photographer. So undoubtedly, I end up with lots of duds. So what I like to do is give one star rating to the photos that I know are good in camera. That way, when I offload the images to my computer, I can quickly pull up all the star rated ones in a desktop app called Viewer by Sony, drag them into a separate folder, import them to Lightroom, and just solely focus on editing those curated images. It just makes my workflow so much faster and I don't have to go through a thousand images again. 
Now on the bottom here, it's set to follow custom photo and video, and I would change this to movie shooting, but unfortunately it's not in here at all. So we'll leave it as is, because when you hit the record button during playback, it would just jump into movie recording mode. Now, because there are so many menu items, undoubtedly, searching for the ones we need to change all the time can get annoying, which is why I highly recommend taking advantage of the My Menu system. This allows you to place some of your most changed functions at the top of the menu, so you don't have to go digging for them. And these functions are ones that don't really need to be assigned a button for. I won't go over them one by one, but here's what I have. Moving on, the tab underneath my menu is the home menu. All of these now are self-explanatory since we went over each function, but I wanna point it out to you so you can take full advantage of it. Here's where you can quickly change things like frame rate, file format, bit rate, enable log shooting, etc., without having to dig through the menu for some of these items. All right, so let's go ahead and briefly go over the photography settings. Now, while the ZV-E1 is marketed to be a video camera first, it is still a fantastic photo camera as well. 12 megapixel may seem little, but it's enough for sharing photos on social media. Personally, some of my best photos came out of the same sensor. The only caveat is that the camera does not have a mechanical shutter. It uses an electronic shutter. Not gonna be a huge deal if you're capturing anything with natural light, but if any particular LED lights are present, you may see weird lines appearing in your photos. So without further ado, shift the ticker over to the left and immediately you'll notice the touchscreen UI has changed. On side A, the second option is now drive mode and you would come here to change to burst shooting, self timer and bracket shooting. And over on side B, the first option is now an on-screen shutter. And that's pretty much all that is different here. Let's go ahead and jump into the main menu. So we'll start off with image quality. Here, I typically leave the first option as JPEG. Most applications will be able to open JPEG files as opposed to HEIF. Next up, file format. I personally shoot RAW and JPEG. With these cameras, I tend to edit my RAW photos, but if you don't plan on doing that, just keep it as JPEG. For RAW file type, we have three different options and you can read up on the differences here on the screen in detail, but I recommend choosing lossless compressed RAW. It's a newer file format that has the same quality as uncompressed RAW, but at a reduced file size, so huge win in my opinion. Plus, as a 12 megapixel camera, the RAW files aren't going to be as big as some of the ones you'll find in the higher megapixel cameras. JPEG quality, we're going to do extra fine. Image size 12M, aspect ratio. It really only affects JPEG, but leave it as 3.2. And since we already did video features, we're gonna go ahead and skip these. APS-C Super 35 shooting. I turn this off. As explained in the video section, this crops into your sensor one and a half times. Great for video, great for 1080p video, but not so much for photos as it reduces the megapixel from 12 to five. High ISO noise reduction, I have this as off. Color space, sRGB. Lens compensation, I leave this all on auto. Moving on to file. File and folder settings. You can change the file name of your photos here, which may be a great idea if you use multiple Sony cameras. That way you don't run into issues of accidentally having the same file name when you offload everything. Folder name, I like to use date form, so it'll create separate folders for each of the days I take photos. Skipping on down to drive mode. We already went over drive mode, so the only thing that we need to talk about is interval shoot function. Now this is our main time-lapse feature where we can create the highest quality time-lapse possible because it's taking a series of RAW or JPEG images which you can then stitch together using softwares like LR time-lapse or DaVinci Resolve. And you have a lot of control over this. Perhaps a little too much control since you can actually edit the photos and the raw photos have a ton more dynamic range than you would get from your video files. So unless you're a passionate time-lapse enthusiast, just stick to the video time-lapse mode I showed you earlier. After that, let's go ahead and skip all the way down to shoot display. Live view display set. Now this is a very important one here. You wanna make sure live view display setting effect is on because you wanna see the exposure change happening in real time as you change your settings on your camera. And I believe that's pretty much it for photos. All right, welcome to miscellaneous and frequently asked question. Number one, 4K 120p is missing. The update for this will actually be dropping in August 2023, so if you're watching this after the fact, you would just need to update the firmware of your camera. Number two, 60p and 120p is missing. I only see 50p and 100p. So the reason why that is is because you're in PAL mode. Come back to the briefcase tab, go to area and date, go to NTSC and PAL selector, and choose NTSC. Number three, overheating. Here's what I would check first. Number one, auto power off temperature. Make sure this is set on high. Number two, 
SD card write speed. This is the next culprit. If you're shooting 4K 10-bit 422, you need a fast write speed SD card, a V90 at the very least. Shooting with a slow card means it takes longer to process the data, therefore making your camera work harder. Number three, battery. The next thing I would check is the battery. While I haven't personally experienced it myself, I have seen reports of third-party batteries also contributing to heating issues. Try using the default battery the camera came with and see if the issue still persists. Number four, connecting the smartphone to control the camera or transferring photos. On your phone, go ahead and download the Creators app, open it and select Connect Camera. Then on your camera, head to the green globe, Connection and PC Remote, Smartphone Connection, and it will tell you to check the app. The camera should now appear on the app. Hit Connect and follow the on-screen prompts. Once connected, you will be able to do remote shooting and transfer raw photos and videos to your smartphone. You know what? I think you're all set now. If you enjoy what I do and want to support the channel, consider purchasing the custom settings file or donate directly via the super thanks button on YouTube. Thank you so much for watching and now go forth my friends, make amazing content with the ZVE1. Peace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to create beautiful websites. No coding knowledge whatsoever. Perfect for people like me because I just want to make YouTube videos for you guys and not have to worry about coding my entire website. Simply just select one of their templates to get started. Every aspect is easily customizable with their drag and drop feature. Whether you're in need of a portfolio, an e-commerce store, or even a simple blog, design it with Squarespace. Use my link down below to test it out. And when you're ready to launch your first website or domain, use my code Jason Vong to save 10% off. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.